Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. Now, this is the 15-minute chart of silver provided by netdania.com. So, I've drawn in a number of trend lines here. You can see, well, this snapshot, which is the 15-minute, which gives us about seven, eight, nine days, something like that. It, it goes up to about $19, 1910, actually. So that's pretty much the bulk of the move that we've been looking at. It had been bouncing under 20 for a long time. This is going to be the major snapshot that we're looking at. And there's these descending trend lines. This is what you see when you have a bottom spike, a rolling over situation until you know a series of trend lines that are ultimately violated when the rally finally comes. So you can see the first trend line here starts at about 19, goes down to 18 and a half, a 50 cent drop. Nothing big. The next one though, you can see we start here at about 1870 and we're down to 1820. Same amount, but a shorter amount of time. And then the next one here comes in about 1850, we'll say and then we're down about 1770. So it's accelerating, and that's what you see on these things. So the big question is, is this the spike bottom? Now, you have to look at a series of time sequences to try to determine that and to see if the volume comes in. The big thing to note here is that this volume is on a sharp decrease. So if this is actually a rolling over, then we're gonna see the volume spike up again. Uh, I think we're going to see the volume probably spike up again, even if we get something like this going up from here. Uh, let's actually remove that and use the arrows. But uh, so the question is, is this the bottom or not? And you saw on the member side, I put the poll. So if we're talking about something like this, breaking this trend line. This trend line is going to be something to watch very, very carefully because that's going to be the first trend line that will be violated in this rolling over situation. It's got three touch points. It seems to be fairly valid. Now, if we roll over and test the lows, we're going to be looking at greater volume coming in. Now, just a anecdotal thing I mentioned in the last video that one of the things I look for is the amount of physical of the coins I'm looking at start to dry up. I did notice that people had mentioned that the 100 ounce bars, or I'm sorry, the 1000 ounce bars had dried up, but I don't really pay a lot of attention to those. So I'm not seeing the same thing that I saw in 2008. And uh, that was just a complete evaporation of available silver. I remember watching the Silver Eagle very closely in 2008. And even though the silver price price went down to, I think it was 850 or a little bit below that, I never saw the Silver Eagles go below $16. So that was a huge premium. It pretty much dried up and everybody ran out. If you were buying silver at that time, you remember that we're not seeing anything like that and and that's going to be just the kind of gut feeling that i can't really explain but it seems to me that that's kind of an indication that we haven't hit the bottom yet so we will watch and we will see it's a very short amount of time before this trend line is tested whether we break through it to the upside or whether we roll over and go down Let's pull up the MACD just to see what the MACD says as far as rolling over. So you can see the MACD is kind of rolling up. That doesn't really mean a lot. Now let's look at the spike bottom issue. I want to take you to the one hour. And you can see that the, the biggest volume doesn't come in on this. Well, it does come in on that spike, but there's some rival volume here. So if we push out a little bit farther, let's go to the two hour and take a look. And it's not really a spike bottom yet. Let's go to the eight hour. Now that's looking more like that sort of spike bottom that we're looking for. So it is possible and you can see that the candlestick spike has about a, on this eight hour chart, we're talking about 17 
61 down to about 1734. So there's about a 30, 30 cent spike size on that window. And then the daily, you can see that there's a spike that it doesn't rival the biggest spike we've ever seen. You can see that, this spike here, an enormous spike. So we're not at anywhere near that size, but again, we're at a much lower price. So percentage wise, it's a tough call. We'll just watch and wait and see. I have not pulled the trigger on anything. And the main reason is just a gut instinct. I can't really explain it to you. It's just one of those gut things. And that's one of the reasons why we have the member site and why I do these videos is to try to share with you my thinking. Sometimes my thinking is intuitive. I can't completely explain it. But I know when I get that feeling that I have to buy, I haven't gotten that feeling yet. So let's look at some articles that I wanted to look at. Now I want to cover the debt to the penny, the daily, the debt. And this is something that we hear about just to give you a view of the fundamentals that they haven't changed. So you've seen that I cover this often. I want to do a little bit different spin on this, but let's look at today's date, the 23rd. We go back a year, we can see 16.738 trillion. Now you've heard the government and the press reports that we're running a deficit of about 500 billion. If that's the case, then why do we have 17,752? So you can see 17,752 minus 16,738. You do the math, but it's over a trillion dollars. Now I wanted to dig a little bit deeper into these numbers. There's two categories that we have here. We have debt held by the public and intra-governmental holdings. Now you can do what I did and do an exact phrase search and try to <laughs> chase it down. You're, you're gonna get a bunch of rabbit trails. But the main thing is that we've gone from 11,964, that's debt held by the public. Now that's gonna be pension funds and foreign investors and anybody but the government. And that's gone from 11,964 to 12,749. So that's about $800 billion. That's in the public debt. So right there, we're 300 billion above what they're reporting. But the intra-governmental holdings are 4,773 and you can see it's gone up to 5,002. So about two two fifty billion in in that intergovernmental holdings. So let's look at that real quick. I wanted to examine that, and then we're going to get over to Bill Holter because I think this is a very important article that, to, that is by far uh, I track the hits on the blog, and uh, it's by far the most popular. So that shows you where the sentiment is. But before we get to Bill Holter, let's take a look at this intragovernmental holdings. Now, if you start to chase down this rabbit trail, it's endless. But one of the places it's going to lead you to is this Social Security website. And the vast bulk of these intragovernmental holdings are in this Old Age and Survivors Insurance, OASI. And you can pull up this data. You can look at all this stuff. There's some crazy stuff you can pull up here. We'll click, click on the link here just to show you. It goes all the way back to 1937, and you can see total receipts. These are in millions, okay? Total receipts, total expenditures. You can see that the receipts started at 767, 375. They grow gradually here. And then you can see at the beginning, the expenditures were virtually nothing. That makes sense. And then you watch and see the expenditures catch up and then all of a sudden there's an acceleration again. And then you have the assets at the end of the year and that continually grows. But again, these assets, these are debts owed to the government by the government, if that makes any sense. But if you think about it, it's something where the trust fund should have grown enormously should have had enormous assets because when it began, virtually no one who had paid into it was collecting 
that's what it seems to show but then of course it just goes wacky and you can't track it anymore and it was rated so I'm gonna to go to an article that clarifies it a little bit but again it's a lot of smoke and mirrors so let's read this article here this is from Seeking Alpha I don't have the whole thing but the first page is enough and this is from Scott Anderson are intra-governmental holdings real debt as everyone who is paying attention knows the amount of U.S. debt outstanding is fast approaching 16.4 trillion. Uh, hopefully, it's going to let me read this. But whom do we owe it to? Most of the debt, about 11.6 trillion of it, represents debt held by the public. This portion of the debt is easy to comprehend. It could be bonds held by investors. Well, I'm going to have to copy this and read it to you because they're going to not let me read this. So let's just do this real quick, and we'll just read it from a notepad, because they're not going to let me read this. And we're going to have to do a word wrap. And we're going to have to do the font. So bear with me. OK. It could be bonds held by investors, savings bonds given to children, bonds purchased by the Chinese government, or even bonds purchased by our own, our good buddies at the Federal Reserve. The remaining balance, $4.8 trillion, known as intragovernmental holdings, is what I'd like to discuss today. Intragovernmental debt represents money we owe to ourselves. At $2.8 trillion, the Social Security Trust Fund is the largest and most recognizable portion, with most of the balance being similar programs for government employees and the military. There, you can see there's the people that are going to shaft. There's the people that are going to be rioting. All of this adds up to $4.8 trillion. At this point, you might be wondering how exactly one would go about getting into debt to his herself. For example, let's take a trip back in time and assume that a given month the government collects $75 billion in Social Security taxes deducted from paychecks but only makes Social Security payments of $50 billion. The $25 billion balance is spent by the general fund. Okay, now there's your explanation right there. It's spent by the general fund. Now, if you think about it, if this is really a trust fund and you wanted to protect the fund against government pilfering, then wouldn't you make it so that they had to invest in bonds or maybe even stocks, but certainly at least bonds of companies, perhaps American or overseas companies, so that they had to liquidate those? No, they require them to purchase government securities. So it was a very easy sleight of hand to just take that money and uh, then put an IOU. So it's spent by the general fund, and a $25 billion IOU is penciled in on the balance sheet as intragovernmental. So the real question becomes, can you really owe yourself money? I think the answer is no, and that the whole concept of intragovernmental holdings is just an accounting farce. In reality, the $4.8 trillion balance of intragovernmental holdings simply represents an up-to-date tab of the amount already spent. And he gives an example. So, so what does this mean? Should we all breathe a sigh of relief and simply write off the $4.8 trillion of intragovernmental debt on our books? No, on the relief. Yes, on the write-off. The truth is, the internal debt has never really mattered. So admitting to ourselves that it truly represents what it truly represents doesn't change anything other than the magnitude of the lies we tell ourselves. The problem is, if we stop pretending that we owe ourselves money, we also have to stop pretending that the Social Security Trust Fund exists. Then we would have to stop pretending that Social Security isn't a run-of-the-mill welfare program and stop pretending that FICA isn't just a regular old 15% income tax. Are we allowed to say any of that out loud? I don't know if most of you remember, but when Obama first came into office, he made a statement about how we're already bankrupt and everybody hushed him up and said, don't say that um, because the emperor's new clothes, 
actually the emperor himself was admitting he doesn't have any clothes on. But anyway, so we know that there is no fund, there is no trust fund. It's all, the money's already spent, and they're just doing a kick the can down the road scenario and suppressing gold and silver because we know that these obligations and this is going to be the key thing bill holter is going to explain this better than i can so i'm going to read this whole thing these obligations are just simply one person owing something to another person there is no money there and they can evaporate in an instant so Let's read this article. This is the most popular article on the blog today, and it's called Gold and Silver Will Never Go Up Again. Gold and Silver Will Never Go Up. I've read this phrase in the comment section of many blogs and articles over the last few weeks. The phrase itself speaks to how poor and washed out the sentiment has become in silver and gold. Gold bashers, blog shills, and trolls have been out in full force to add salt to the wounds of anyone bullish the metals. Sentiment has been absolutely destroyed, and the tone can only be described as despair. I wrote a three-part series last week on the hows and whys of metals and markets manipulation. If by now you do not or cannot see the manipulation for what it is and what they are trying to accomplish, you may never. The phrase itself is actually wrong. It should be gold and silver can never go up. There is a difference. Let me explain. Gold and silver are physical metals which have been used as monies throughout much of history. An ounce of gold disregarding fineness that was minted 20 years ago, 200 years ago, or even 2,000 years ago is still just an ounce of gold today. Yes, the value does vary versus other goods like oil, housing, food, or even a cup of coffee. But generally speaking, gold has at least kept up over the long term in terms of purchasing power. A house is still a house, a gallon of gas is still a gallon of gas, and a cup of coffee is still a cup of coffee. But they all cost more dollars than they did a few years ago, and especially versus many years ago stuff went up so to speak in terms of dollars so stuff went up in terms of dollars so in essence everything costs more today but is this really true the answer of course is no nothing went up what happened is the purchasing power or value of dollars has gone down this simply means it takes more dollars today to purchase the exact same goods versus years ago as a result of inflation. Nothing goes up or down versus the dollar. It is the dollar that fluctuates and in, long, in the long term the fluctuation has been decidedly down for the dollar. It is also very easy to why this is why this is from the following chart of the U.S. monetary base, and he gives the uh, St. Louis uh, Fed monetary base. You'll notice that up until 2008, the money supply was steadily rising, inflating, until something happened, the crash of the credit markets. Since then, the money supply has simply exploded, and you can see that there. The proper term for what you see on the chart is hyperinflated. By the way, this is merely a chart showing you the creation of new dollars. Okay, so let's use a little common sense and the laws of supply and demand. The phrase gold and silver will never go up is an emotional one which is just plain wrong. First, and as I explained above, it is what happens with the dollar that prices itself in gold or anything else for that matter. It is more than obvious that a whole bunch of new dollars have been created since 2008 trillions of dollars upon trillions of dollars in fact and this does not even include the fractional reserve aspect where one new dollar is levered into many more this was done to save the system when in fact if you think about it the overcreation of dollars will ultimately destroy the dollar itself and thus the financial system ask yourself this question will the dollar be worth more or less a year from now you could even stretch the question out and ask the same thing five years, 10 years, or even 50 years. Of course, 
Another question you might ask is whether or not the dollar will be in existence in any of these time frames. My point is this, you could ask the question of whether the dollar will be worth more or less in the future to anyone and I bet you get the answer less than 98% more of the time. I'm sorry, less, more than 98% of the time. So what he's saying is you could ask the man on the street, will the dollar be worth more or less in the future? 98% of the time they'd say it'd be worth less. Everyone knows the answer and everyone knows there is inflation embedded in the system. This is a no-brainer, right? If this is such a no-brainer, then why would anyone in their right mind think that gold or silver could go down over the long term? Now think about that. Think about the point that he's making there. How could anyone think or say gold and silver will never go up again? How is this possible in dollar terms for gold and silver not to go up? Do you see the circle we just went in but doesn't quite connect? The dollar will always go down, but gold and silver will never go up? It doesn't make any sense or logic whatsoever, does it? Another way to look at this is from the supply standpoint. The supply of dollars has increased more than five-fold since 2008. At best, the supply of total gold has increased a shade over 10% since then. One could possibly say gold was grossly overvalued in 2008, around $900 per ounce. Others could disagree. What cannot be argued is the fact that the amount of dollars outstanding today versus the amount of gold in existence above ground and deliverable simply dwarfs the ratio it stood in 2008. Actually, I think an argument can be made for the above chart representing the price of gold. Gold's dollar price should be a clone of this chart, especially if gold holdings have not increased by the U.S. And they have not increased. They're actually all going or have already gone to Asia. Something very serious did happen in 2008. We had to hyperinflate in order to stop a deflation of credit. The only way to have done this and to retain credibility was to falsify the gold price. This was and is being done. The important thing for you as an individual to understand is that you have an opportunity to exchange dollars which have been grossly overprinted for gold which cannot be printed. Here is the catch. Gold and silver have been overprinted via derivatives. The supply has been diluted by paper contracts which promise to deliver metal. Since the supply of dollars has been flooded, the supply of gold and silver had also had to be deluged. The only way to have done this was to offer promises because the real deal does not exist to deliver in anything close to the quantities necessary. Gold and silver, if you notice, are the promise. They can't go up and they can't go down because all they can be is a weight of metal. This game of promising more and more metal will come to an end when some amount of weight cannot be delivered then we will really find out just how many dollars are required to procure something that does not exist. As horrific as the living conditions will be, it will be fun in a perverse way to watch the scramble for something which not only doesn't exist, but was portrayed to be common. So, fantastic article. And... The same thing applies to this debt. This is money that doesn't exist. It's been promised. This, these promises will be defaulted upon. These promises for gold and silver will be defaulted upon. Now, if you've been following the blog and the member site for the years that I've done it, I've done the YouTube since about 2007, 2008, most of my videos start in 2010, but I've been doing this for a very long time. And if you've been moving your assets into physical and getting your wealth adjusted so that the bulk of what you own is actually in the physical metals and just a small percentage is in other things, paper promises, then you're not in such a rush to jump at the potential buy that's going to be here. 
It looks to me like it's rolling over. I think that they're going to try to put in one final spike low. I may be wrong. I may have not picked the bottom on this one. I just don't have that feeling. But uh, there's no question when you look at the numbers of the amount of promises that are made, the debt that's increasing a trillion dollars a year, and the money supply exploding with the price being suppressed, that uh, even if you stack right now at this price, there's no way that you can lose. And we'll talk to you next time.